I remember him pushing me to the ground and whipping me. My mother was complicit in that she was a classic narcissist. He was your classic this psychopath. This type of harm can start very, very young. And it's, it sounds like this was a closed community where mother, father, grandmother, there were not safe individuals. I'm Dr. Patrice Berry, licensed clinical psychologist in Virginia, and I have my own private practice where I provide individual therapy and psychological testing. And I'm also a content creator on social media, providing educational content on mental health topics. I'm a therapist and also as a psychologist, I do psychological testing and I work with people that have histories of trauma, that have uh, been adopted, that are involved with the criminal justice system. And really, it's my goal to help them find ways to better meet their needs and address issues within their life. One of the guys had put his cigarette out on my back. He was my step cousin's friend. Other people that we knew from the town was like, oh, yeah, you know, he has a girlfriend. I'm like, that's not what he told me. I get a call on my phone and it's some girl. He's like, yeah, you're dealing with my man. Now I want to beat your ass. So I go to meet him. He opens the door and out walks a bunch of females. One girl walks up and she just punches me right in the face. Then they all like basically attacked me, pounced on top of me. The guy that I was talking to come in and they had a weapon in their hand. It was like a wooden pole and they start beating me with, with the pole. I'm like backed into the, in the kitchen and my back is against the stove. And I grab the stove burner and I just swing, boom. And I hit one of the girls, she goes down and I just ran. The girl that I hit comes around the corner with the same stove burner and whacks me in the face with it, boom. And I fall back and every time like I fall back, somebody like grabs me and holds me up. The girl picked up the bottle that was on the table when I came in and she like bashes me over the head with the bottle and I just touched my face and when I looked at my and I looked at my hand and my hand was completely covered in blood I'm hearing them talk about what to do with my dead body what am I going to do at this point I'm probably going to die you know they'd already said might as well kill her because we're going to go to jail at one point these are the men grabbed my pants and started pulling my pants down. One of the females was like, what are you doing? He was like, oh, well, you know, and she was like, nah, 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 not here. Apparently assault and attempted murder is okay, but it's not. Obviously I can't fight seven people. So I decided to just start praying. There isn't a human being on this planet that strikes fear in my heart. I will never be afraid of anyone ever again. She is such a survivor. And I'm so glad that she had the courage to come forward. Often when individuals are victims of this type of harm, it can be really tough. The hard part is it sounds like he was cheating on somebody else. And it bothers me when in a relationship, when somebody takes it out on the other person and not the person that they're in the relationship with. Because I think that's the person that should be held accountable because she did not know that really had to add to some of this harm. And this wasn't just a random act of violence. This was somebody that she was dating and that she probably liked, which can make this harm a little bit more confusing because because she never saw that coming. And then to have this happen, it just had to be really traumatic, really painful for her. The first step is to help them feel safe in my office, help them feel believed, seen, and heard. Because there are some people that if she didn't have all the medical records and all of that to go along with it, there are some people that would think that might question parts of it. And, and for me, the first step in therapy is connecting with that person because it takes so much strength to come forward and to talk to somebody else because often the victim, the person that was harmed is thinking, why didn't I see it? They're already putting themselves through so much and she didn't do anything wrong and she didn't deserve what happened to her. And that's where therapy, having a neutral person, somebody that does not know you, that does not know that situation because it's often that the person knows it in their heart, but to hear somebody else say that can often be very healing for the individual, for the survivor. 
think one of the biggest things is to let them cry. When they apologize for showing emotion, letting them know it would be weird if they weren't showing emotion in, in that moment. To let them know that there's no right way to grieve or to heal. That as long as they're continuing to put forth the effort to do the work, that that's what's what's most important. And it won't, they won't always have good days. Some days they'll have really bad days. Some days it can get really hard. And to not try to make them feel better immediately because a person has to first feel heard before they start that journey of healing. Because sometimes we do this toxic positivity where it's like, where people say things that, and they mean well, but it can be harmful and it can minimize the other person's emotion where they say, well, at least it wasn't, or at least you didn't. And the person means to be helpful, but it can come off dismissive to to the person's experience. Even an attempted rape and attempted harm can still cause psychological trauma. It can still, because in that moment, the potential of that was real. The potential of her almost dying was so real that being able to sit with her in that, because sometimes a person can have a lot of survivor's guilt almost of having to now live with this pain and live with everything. And so just helping somebody feel safe that whatever they're feeling is okay and that their story isn't too difficult or too too much for a trauma specialist to be able to hold space for them. Trauma can be anything that overwhelms our nervous system. This incident, she had a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. That's often how we view trauma that's experienced as an adult. Childhood trauma and developmental trauma is, is completely different because I hope that she had those supportive people already in place. She had some resources and that's where there can be post-traumatic growth. There can be this resilience that can come out of situations. But in that moment as a therapist, I would first sit with them with where they are and see where they see things going next. When someone goes through a very stressful experience and when they're telling it again sometimes they can tell it from a vantage point where they go back they're almost in that moment now from what I saw in her the telling of her story it did seem like she was in this moment wrote telling memories of what happened and that's a sign of somebody that's done some healing and definitely done some work there are people that I've worked with when when they've told me a story about things that happened when they were five or six it was almost as though this 37-year-old is now back being five or six because trauma memories don't know time. And before people do trauma work to reprocess the memories, to be able to work through those past events, sometimes they can pop up and those are flashbacks. That's when things just kind of pop up out of nowhere because in the middle of a trauma, your brain doesn't have time to neatly categorize what just happened. So this morning, what I had for breakfast is stored away in my hippocampus, the memory storage of, of my brain. But if I had a trauma happen, if a bear is chasing me, I don't need to remember exactly what day it was and exactly what the bear looked like. I, I don't need those memories. I just need to get safe. I would be uh, put into a van and taken to Freemasons once a month. There, there would be other children. Satanic ritual abuse would take place. My grandmother, his mother, and one of his sisters were tasked with the responsibility of teaching me about how to be the best child worker I could be. The first at the hands of my father occurred when I was four years old and I remember him pushing me to the ground and f***ing me. My mother was complicit in that her absence spoke volumes. She was a classic narcissist. He was your classic psychopath. At the age of five, my father drove me to my grandmother's house. She took me into her bedroom and shut the door and locked it. And she said, you will do what you are told, otherwise there will be trouble. She's describing cult-like abuse. And this type of harm can start 
very, very young. And it sounds like this was a closed community where there were not safe adults, where mother, father, grandmother, there were not safe individuals. And this was her normal. This was all that she knew. And that is where this type of harm can rewire the way that people's brains normally work because what she was experiencing, no child should ever experience. It can take a lot of work and growth and therapy to heal because she didn't have those safe people to protect her. The thing that really stands out to me is the harm coming from the people that should have kept her safe. And that's where it can really confuse a child because children are wired to love their parents. It can be really hard and they can not have a safe place to go when things like that happen, especially so early, so young. She was only four years old. Based on the information she provided about her parents, individuals that are narcissistic often view their children as objects and as extensions of themselves. And they often struggle with having empathy, with seeing things from somebody else's perspective. And then individuals with psychopathic antisocial features or traits, they often struggle with the right and wrong, with morality, with things that you are are not supposed to do and do whatever they want, even if it causes harm to somebody else. As therapists, we're trained how to help individuals that are narcissistic. We're starting to learn and grow how to help survivors of narcissistic abuse. Narcissism is a spectrum. That's where some people can fall really on narcissistic personality disorder, or some people can just have some minor features. I tried to take my own life three times during that 18 months living with my father and brother. Not only was I abused, I was physically abused. I was thrown against walls, I was stomped on, kicked, smacked around, I was psychologically tortured, I was chained to a bed. Men and sometimes women would come in to abuse me. I came home from school one day and I saw my father in bed with another woman. That spun me into such shock because I was his mistress. She describes it in her mind from a very young age, she thought she was her father's mistress, which once again just talks about those boundary violations and how she was not safe. And when she found him with somebody else, there might have been a jealousy, but this comes from being groomed at such a young age and that harm, the harm that she experienced by his hands, with, according to this video as well. I don't think she had a healthy view of what love should be. And it was really powerful when she said that there was no use in crying out for help because there was none. That describes a level of hopelessness that really can lead victims in situations like this to make attempts on their life or to feel like there's no point, there's no use. And learned helplessness is real, where you try, you try to get free and you just can't. And all you can do is just give up. My mom left us alone in the evenings a lot and he would bring me gifts. He brought me crayons, a coloring book once and then proceeded to me as I was coloring. Another time he took me to ice cream alone and instead of going to ice cream he drove into a, a nearby field. He proceeded to also abuse me in that field. It's also had um, threatened me that if I were to tell, my mother would die. And so I was five years old when my mother hooked up with this boyfriend and he was a scary guy. Back at home, my mother and her boyfriend would have in front of us as a sort of explanation, I guess, of what's going on. This is what your future holds. I was on all sides being told it was okay. And then also my father, my sister must have told him this other guy, me and she walked in on it and one day he came over we saw him on Sundays and he said so I understand you were just don't make a big deal about it and so the first time I saw them have 
in front of me, I was in the house and I heard noises and my mom called for me to come into the room. I said, "What? what's happening? I was scared because I had never seen anything like that. And it's intercourse happening in front of me and I had no concept. And it looked like bad, like she was being hurt. And they said, sit down. And I sat down and they, and they said, watch. And I just said, are, are you okay? I did not understand until years later, it being popped in my head like oh my gosh they were having sex in front of me Other occurred too where you know the perpetrators were interested in um giving me pleasure when you have children early and then you're to them, they tend to continue that behavior. So my brother um, continued that behavior with me, somehow got neighborhood boys involved. And so what happened till I was about nine and my stepdad came in my life was there was periods of time where we'd be out playing hide and go seek or tag or just whatever. And it would be time to pants, Lisa. And so they would like all zero in on me, chase me down. Usually I ended up in a room in the house and they would tear off my clothes, hysterically laughing, pry open my limbs and, okay, well, let's try this and put this there or that. And so that was an ongoing joke and behavior towards me in the neighborhood. It's so important that kids be taught about consent and then also the correct names of their body parts. That is something that I've heard often individuals that are not safe. If a child knows the correct names for their body parts, they often will not target that child. And being able to find ways to create safety for children, that's something that's really important to me, where if something's not okay, I encourage people to not just tell your mom, your sister, your dad, tell everyone, tell the teacher, tell, because my goal is safety. It's really common that when a child does disclose that sometimes if they do end up in foster care or if they do end up removed from the situation, they often have their own guilt about that they did something wrong to impact the family or sometimes families will try to get them to change their story so that the uncle doesn't go to jail. And that's where I think prioritizing what's best for kids is incredibly important. When she talked about being exposed to adult activity, that's one of the less commonly talked about forms of child harm that we don't always talk about because that is like she was too young and also like that's it's different if a kid just walks in whoops and then but but to be called in and then to be made to sit and watch that was way too much that for her age at all and that's where some of that grooming can happen slowly for every story she discussed she was too young to be able to consent there were people that i think the family trusted but their interest in her was not appropriate. Because often people fear that stranger in the store when actually what's more common is somebody that the child knows and trusts, somebody that's in their orbit. And I think the adults have to have good boundaries. And then I want my child to know that if something ever isn't okay, because what she described with the first handyman, with him lying and saying that something bad would happen to her mom, that's really common. Individuals like that, they often do lie. They often do try to use gifts. There is no look of someone like that because sometimes I think people have in their mind oh the person's going to look a certain way or they're going to act a certain way and really what people have to be on guard for is an adult trying to meet with my child one-on-one -on -one without me there and so some commonly known signs of grooming is an adult giving children a lot of gifts and so that's just because somebody does one of these things doesn't necessarily mean but as a parent I just want to watch out for this if I see some of these things happening there's a seclusiveness and isolation where the adult is trying to have a secret so I teach all of my clients I teach my own child child that there are good secrets and there are bad secrets. And a good secret is like somebody's birthday. A bad secret is because an adult shouldn't ask a child to keep something 
like that from their parent. That's a sign that they're that it's wrong. And it's not the child's fault. The child has every right to tell. I'm so glad that as she told her story, I didn't hear that she still had shame. It sounds like she knew that what they did was wrong. She didn't do anything wrong. That it wasn't her fault. That they were the ones that crossed the boundary. And it was okay that she was confused. It was okay if she wasn't able to tell somebody at the time. And that's where I wonder what advice she would even give to kids or to teens that might be in a situation like that. Because I wonder if she would encourage them to know that it's not their fault and to try to, to, to seek safety. Thank you to everyone that shared their story. I know it had to be hard. It had to take a lot. And in sharing their stories, I hope that they were able to reclaim some of their power. If you're watching and if you've been through anything like that, please make sure to check out resources available in your area. There are national helplines. In the United States, there is a text crisis line 988 for anybody that is struggling or needs someone to chat or talk with. There is help and that's where I really encourage people if you are looking for a therapist to find somebody that's a good fit for you.